Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to take you very briefly through the evaluation's findings. And um, I'm going to talk about the five key messages. So the first key message concerns performance. Um, we concluded that the region has used concessional resources well. So many countries in the region are now uh, lower middle income countries and middle income countries, and they're less reliant on concessional resources, which is a good thing. Um, but this is less true for fragile states and for small island development states um, in the region. But overall, the evaluation found that ADB's project performance has improved in ADF 11 and ADF 12, and performance is stronger in this ADF period than any other ADF period. So the second um, message concerns the use of PBA. And the main consequence of the merger uh, of ADF concessional resources with the OCR balance sheet is that ADF now supports a much smaller group of countries and they're, they're very different countries. And the PBA formula doesn't really fit with their development needs. Um, and finally, now that concessional resources is part of the ADB balance sheet, then banking principles really need to apply to the allocation of those resources. The third key message concerns fragility, conflict, and violence, also known as FCAS. The evaluation found that FCAS is not particularly well addressed by ADB and then hence also by ADF. But as we heard yesterday in a meeting, we did find evidence that FCAS approaches are beginning to um, emerge. Um, for instance, in procurement and the fact that there are more staff in the field, um, but much more, there's still quite a long way to go. And I think for the evaluation, fragility is, is the biggest issue and it's the most worrying issue for the future. And when you combine that with, say, climate change and environmental degradation, there are huge known and unknown consequences of uh, climate change. So. Fragility is an issue which is going to expand. The fourth message um, regards the need to crowd in private sector to help achieve the SDGs. And it's, it's well recognized that public sector resources are not going to be sufficient to achieve the SDGs. So new ways need to be found by ADB to crowd in um, the private sector. And finally, the, uh, the fifth key message is about the need for ADF to ad adapt to these changed circumstances that we've just been talking about. And, and this was um, you know, a, a key issue that was discussed in the replenishment round this week. Um, because um, ADF is now focused on a group of, of fragile countries where it's um, harder to achieve results, there's a need to be realistic about what can be achieved. There's a need to simplify fund management and there's a need to develop a long-term vision for ADF. This leads to um, six recommendations. So recommendation one is to separate the allocation of grants from the allocation of concessional loans. Recommendation two is to streamline grant set-asides in the way here in the slide. Recommendation three is to um, scale up support to private sector development, particularly by the introduction of a private sector window. Recommendation four is to give greater focus to climate change and adaptation, particularly in the SIDS. Recommendation five is to tailor ADB systems um, to better match the needs of fragile states and SIDS. And recommendation six is to continue the um, post-conflict special allocation um, in Afghanistan, which some people refer to as a, no longer a special allocation, but a structural allocation. Um, and I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, we had anticipated three rounds. Uh, one, basically, to talk about development results of the ADF. One, to... Uh, dig in more into fr um, uh, fragility issues and, and one more on the, on the future of the, uh, of the ADF. I think maybe after every round we can also, hopefully if there's time, uh, ask, some, uh, ask the audience to ask one or two questions before moving to the, to the next round. But um, um, maybe just starting off, 
um, with uh, Minister Toyoti. Um, uh, you know, uh, can you give us just some some small overview of um, some of the development results that are being achieved uh, with the with the help of the uh, of the ADF um, in um, well in Samoa, but maybe uh, uh, in in six countries in in general. Well, I'd like to uh, start by saying that uh, Samoa, like uh, the uh, ADF eligible uh, Pacific Island countries, are very appreciative of uh, the availability of uh, ADF uh, resources. Uh, a lot of uh, what we've been doing to uh, get us to where we are today has been the result of uh, uh, good use of uh, sort of ADF uh, resources and uh, was quite uh, in the discussions uh, yesterday uh, we um, appreciate uh, the willingness of uh, uh, donors to, to consider uh, additional funding. Obviously we don't take uh, ADF uh, resources uh, for granted uh, we need to make sure that uh, in terms of our on of our forward uh, uh, development uh, plans, we, we need to uh, also factor in uh, opportunities to engage with our other development partners and to also uh, look more at uh, our own sort of domestic resource uh, mobilization uh, efforts uh, to maintain the momentum, the development momentum that we have now received because of the, uh, the uh, uh, access to uh, ADF uh, uh, resources. Let me also say very briefly, and, and maybe if you don't mind, I'll, this will be just the one general statement that's going to cater for question one, two, and three, um, uh, and, and to allow our uh, audience here to be asking uh, questions. That we do value the independent uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation. Uh, we appreciate that. But I think it's also important that uh, the bank uh, assists uh, uh, our, the governments uh, who receive ADF to uh, establish their own independent uh, sort of monitoring and, and uh, uh, evaluation uh, teams uh, made up of uh, some of our the key uh, development uh, sectors and driven by the uh, Ministry of Finance. In, I'm, I'm saying it's important because I think for me the, the value of the independent uh, evaluation report, uh, it's important that uh, it, it's current uh, at, at the most of six or 12 months, but uh, if we leave it until uh, late and have a evaluation five or six years, then the, obviously the value uh, of the uh, uh, advice in terms of what innovations that we need to make, we will not be achieving that. So I think it's important that we encourage uh, our uh, borrowing countries to set up their own uh, national uh, programs. We uh, obviously, uh, in terms of uh, of aid coordination, I think that's something uh, that's very important that uh, we should be looking at, is to make sure that we have a very uh, sort of robust uh, aid coordination but it's got to be led by the government, not by the development partners. We don't want sort of competition uh, amongst the development partners. We need to uh, sit down with them. We need to assign leadership uh, roles for the different uh, sectors uh, and allow those who, be able, who will be able to, who have the expertise, the technical expertise and the resources to lead. Uh, obviously, we have a very strong uh, relationships with our development partners, Australia, New Zealand, in our region, Japan, and others. So it's important that we assign responsibility for leadership uh, so that there's no confusion and, and to ensure that government remains in control of the uh, direction. Uh, it's, we also have, a, a sort of very briefly, uh, we have the, what we call a cabinet development committee. Uh, we meet twice uh, every second month it's uh, chaired by the Prime Minister and all the Cabinet Ministers and Associate Ministers are there, all the CEOs are there. Uh, and, and it's really an opportunity for uh, ministries and CEOs to present uh, what they consider to be important uh, development projects that governments should fund from our own resources and development partners to continue the momentum in the development of, of our uh, countries. Uh, we think that that's a very useful uh, mechanism 
because it allows uh, cabinet and uh, sort of a very consultative uh, consultation. Uh, but ultimately, it will then go to a national uh, aid coordination committee and to cabinet for sign off. So that way, before we send, when we send the project proposal to ADB or to the World Bank, it's already got uh, the approval of uh, of cabinet. Uh, the political will and the political support is there, and it, it helps too in terms of where we need to make innovations or reforms in a particular sector to make sure that we can achieve those development uh, outcomes that we're, we're looking for. So All right. those are very good. So we'll, I'll stop yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, You've already made yeah, uh, quite some recommendations both for IED and for ADB perhaps, and maybe um, you know, uh, for your own government and your progress in uh, dealing with, uh, with coordination uh, issues. Maybe I can just follow up by asking, um, you know, Deputy Minister Nahid, um, Minister, um, Minister of Finance, uh, Afghanistan, um, from her perspective, uh, just maybe a, a couple of uh, words about uh, progress being made in Afghanistan with the ADF and uh, maybe also linking on this issue of monitoring and evaluation, for instance. Um, a very good afternoon. Thank you so much, Walker. Thank you, IED, for having Afghanistan on this panel. Um, just to start with, Afghanistan in the past um, 18 to 15 years has made great strides in certain areas. Um, with the help of international community, which we are thankful to, uh, that they are still supporting as our revenue has been increasing each year by 20%. Today, 49% of our budget is um, a finance through domestic revenue, which is still a long way to go to, to complete financing of our um, uh, annual budget. Um, one of the selling points that ADB and especially ADF has in Afghanistan, and that has been a request from the government side too, is that ADB has remained very focused on three areas from um, both by the international community's request and also by um, the um, um, Afghan government request that is transport, energy, and agriculture. And that's the value added of the ADF in Afghanistan. And I would like to say that a ADF has not shied away from taking risks in big projects, big infrastructure projects, although there has been a lot of security challenges and implementation challenges in Afghanistan. Um, today, um, despite the 54% poverty rate in Afghanistan, um, due to um, an economy that was mainly dependent on, um, on military forces intervention in the, um, before 2014. Um, the growth rate is, is picking up from 1.3% in 2014 to currently 3% 3, 3 in 2018. But still, there is a long way to go. Um, today, we have over 1,700 kilometers of road constructed, and ADB has definitely has, has had its share in this area. With the help of ADB, we have had 14, uh, 1,400 um, kilometers of transmission lines built. We have 16 substations built. These are all con contribute to poverty reduction and kind of um, paving the ground for uh, private sector intervention um, for local communities, um, uh, for SMEs, and especially there's a big gender component in this whole process, which is streamlined. Um, um, nobody can deny the fact that um, if energy goes to the rural areas or um, um, there are better roads, access to health, access to education, and also um, um, economic activities are um, um, boosted. Um, in terms of um, what, what could be better done um, um, in, um, in, in ADB's intervention in Afghanistan, especially in terms of monitoring and evaluation, um, one thing that we have to um, assure or work on uh, going forward is strengthening the capacity, as Minister has also mentioned, of the national institutions on working across um, um, common standards of, uh, of project implementation um, and evaluation mechanisms and certain criteria that of adherence to those principles. Um, for example, there are in, uh, national institutions inside Afghanistan which um, evaluate uh, projects. Um, um, we have to ensure that there is enough capacity and they, their standard are up to that level that ADB or um, other international organizations are expecting. Um, 
another um, um, another issue in terms of um, how how you mainstream or is strengthening common functions across different um, organizations or different government agencies that is finance procurement and also monitoring um, one of the um, areas that we insist um, that can be improved is not only evaluation but project um, based monitoring systems for each project at the national level um, that could boost performance at the beginning rather than waiting to see the um, cracks um, um, by the end of the project. Thank you, Sal. So yes, thank you. Here. That is also quite a good, uh, good overview and linking it up with, uh, with needs in, in particularly monitoring, I mean, even before evaluation. So um, maybe just passing on to uh, Assistant Secretary Difat uh, John uh, Larkin. I mean, um, you uh, represent a country which is a major donor of the ADF, a staunch um, uh, supporter. Uh, what, what is exactly your rationale uh, for um, supporting the, uh, the ADF, and um, uh, how, how do you see these um, uh, the issues that are being raised by your uh, two colleagues here? No, thanks, um, Walter. Yeah, well, there's probably um, three main reasons why Australia supports the Asian Development Fund. Um, one is that, um, uh, you know, although we're a, the largest uh, grants donor in uh, the Pacific region uh, and um, very interested in, in other countries in the ADF, um, the ADB can do things that we can't do alone uh, or, or can't do as well uh, by ourselves. Um, our, for example, in Afghanistan, um, uh, we provide all our development assistance uh, through the ADB, through the ADF, uh, and it's doing um, a lot of very good work in infrastructure, as you've described, uh, um, Minister, and uh, in uh, and it's playing a great convening power role uh, in mobilising uh, resources of donors. Uh, in the case of the Pacific, uh, the, um, the ADB takes a lead in many infrastructure projects. Uh, we, we don't uh, uh, have as much expertise in that area in our department, so areas like uh, roads, ports, bridges, uh, jetties, um, water, ICT, uh, we, we can uh, co-finance and collaborate with the ADB through ADF grants and achieve greater outcomes than we could achieve by working by ourselves. A second reason is that um, uh, you know, we have very close relationships uh, with uh, the Pacific Island governments, but uh, you know, from time to time, uh, uh, sensitivities flare up, and, and we can have issues. Uh, and on those occasions, um, uh, the presence of the ADB uh, can can be an honest broker, and and, and they can uh, provide a, a good stream of uh, policy and economic advice that. Um, you know, may be difficult for us to provide in situations uh, because it might be seen as uh, tainted or, or, I mean, that's just the realities of uh, bilateral relationships. And I think a third reason, and it's more of a point of principle, uh, is that, uh, you know, we're a developed uh, country member uh, of the ADB, a founding member, and, um, and we, um, uh, like other developed countries, uh, want to contribute our resources uh, to help developing countries through the ADB, and we have a long history um, of being providing financial resources which the bank can leverage uh, to provide development finance, and uh, you know, we uh, do continue to do that and like to continue to do that um, as we go forward. Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I suppose, um, AD uh, Karen, um, the rationale is somewhat similar for the New Zealand and the constituency of uh, ED Surikani, which is a wide range of countries, including many SITs, and, but even in Central Asia, there are some countries. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, but, you know, as, as John said, we've also been a member of, a founding member of ADB and supported ADF since it was established in 1974. Um, and, you know, the, in terms of the outcomes that have been achieved, I think recognising the change in eligibility over that time and the number of countries that have graduated from concessional um, concessional resources, I think, is a really great indicator of the success that we've seen in ADF. Um, over time, I, I guess our interests have changed a little bit, uh, into, as it reflects sort of uh, where ADF has been going. Um, it started off just being loans, it was then loans and grants, and now it's um, purely a, a grant facility. Um, so as you say, for us uh, in New Zealand, it is um, largely 
uh, our interest in the Pacific. Um, New Zealand's a Pacific country. Um, we have a really significant Pacific population, you know, strong people-to-people -people links, and you know, there's really significant challenges um, in the Pacific, climate change, disaster risk, non-communicable diseases. Um, so we uh, put about 60% of our development assistance to the Pacific, but we really welcome the resources that others bring um, including uh, the contributions that are made to ADF uh, by a range of different donors. Um, in terms of how we sort of see ADF uh, performing in, in recent times, one thing that I would really like to, to highlight is um, the base allocation and the change that that's actually made and how ADB is able to, to operate in the Pacific. Um, the base allocation is still relatively new. It's only been there since um, 2015. Uh, when it was uh, introduced at $3 million a year. Um, I partly raised that because one of uh, the evaluation found fi findings that I thought was quite interesting is um, the challenges of trying to work out how effective uh, ADF has been and assessing development results in FCAS and SIDS um, due to the very small allocations that ADB historically had and the, the low disbursement rates. Um, but, you know, so what we've really seen over the last five years, four or five years since the base allocations come in is just the number of projects that ADB has been able to do in the Pacific um, and the scale of those projects as well. Minister Epa talked uh, earlier this week about um, the submarine cable was a really good example of something that um, is genuinely transformational. Uh, five years ago, I don't think ADB was doing really that many projects or anything kind of of that scale. So. I think it's um, uh, also helped ADB be more effective in the Pacific by doing all of those projects. Um, so, you know, we, uh, very much like John said, you know, we really appreciate not just the volume of finance, but the quality of the finance and the, the expertise and knowledge that ADB is able to bring into, uh, into the region as well. Right. Thanks. Well, I think Emma will be very pleased to hear all that and happy to further elaborate on this, uh, on this success and the growth of the portfolio, uh, perhaps, and um, uh, although, I mean, um, one of our findings was still that, uh, relatively speaking, the results are still less good than, although there is an upward path, but uh, relatively the, the, the SIDS and the AFCAS are still uh, the most problematic in terms of the results, but maybe from your perspective you can talk about what part is, uh, what part is doing, how, how the program is expanding, and how you see the development going forward. Well, certainly in the Pacific region, um, it's, it's good to hear the positive feedback on, on what we've been doing. Um, but really, ADF has been absolutely central to our assistance in the Pacific. We've got um, 10 Group A countries in the Pacific who have really limited ability to take on debt um, or, or no ability at all in many cases. And so if we didn't have ADF and the, the ability to provide grants, really our ability to engage in these smallest, most vulnerable of our member countries would be fairly limited, if, if, if at all. Um, so it's been central to that, but we have to remember the needs of the Pacific, um, despite being small countries, are, are actually quite substantial. Um, unfortunately, the cost of doing anything in the islands is, is extremely high. Um, the, sometimes the income numbers you see for the countries give you an impression that all is very well there. Um, but when you look what you can actually buy for that money, it's actually um, countries are far worse off than many of their Asian neighbours. Um, I think we have to recognise that, and we have been. Um, but I think what really ADF has taught us is um, a lot about efficiency and how to do more with less. As Karen mentioned, the base allocation has given us more funds over time, but we've really put a lot of emphasis into coordinating with other donors, listening to government, um, the way we do things, the, our approach to things, and I think our strategy, the Pacific approach, really does talk about how we do things. So it's government-led, working with other partners, looking for regional approaches where possible, regional interventions to leverage the limited capacity of each country on their own and get things moving. I think the cables, submarine cables are a great example of that. Um, but we've got other examples in terms of um, pool procurement of vaccines that is just starting up now that will help um, countries strengthen their whole immunisation systems. And these are important um, going forward. Um, ADF and the, um, particularly the, the thematic pool um, to date has helped us put more emphasis on particular areas 
um, you know, regional cooperation has been a big focus and we've got additional money to do things regionally that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to do going forward. I really hope we have the opportunity to try more innovative things in the Pacific. It's a great place to test things out. Um, and so doing more on gender, more on climate change adaptation. Um, we certainly need more resources, but we need to think how to make things stretch further. Okay, well, this seems like a good moment to just um, maybe ask one or two questions from the audience on maybe the issue of development outcomes in, uh, through ADF. Is, if there's any particular interest in um, uh, maybe the situation in Afghanistan or uh, the SIDS, uh, is there anyone interested in a question? Well, one of the things that came out in, in our consultations and uh, um, uh, in the course of the evaluation is the issue of absorption capacity that has different perspective for each one of you as donors or as management and definitely as recipients. This issue came up both in the Pacific and in Afghanistan too. How, how do you see, what, what's your perspective of, about this? There are many other donors who are interested in operating in the same space. There's more money. You talk about doing more with less, but there's not less, it's more now. More money and more demands on a system that is already uh, under a lot of pressure to deliver. What is your perspective on this issue? Um, thank you. Um, um, we have to see that through um, different lenses. Um, first of all, the need is immense. As I said, we have a long way to go, and if you ask everyone, there will be a list of new suggestions or new needs coming up. Um, absorption capacities, um, there are, you start from the very beginning. When you put forward a proposal, um, the first thing that we expect our partners here is to help us a little bit from the technical side if those projects are really ready to go and to even enter the system. That's the first thing. Um, obviously, there's a need, but what we need to do at the very beginning um, is, is to do the right types of assessments, right types of feasibility studies to sit you know, on this stage. Um, one of the things that we have uh, started, and that's also um, ADB is um, 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 it does support us in that, um, in that effort is a public investment management process that we try to analyze projects before the entry point, um, do the right assessment before they're even part of the pipeline or part of the um, um, or, um, um, or allocations are given. Um, the other issues, as I said earlier, um, common functions. Procurement, um, finance, um, adherence to financing principles, and also uh, project monitoring um, um, basis. Um, we have an international um, mutual accountability system with um, our international partners, and one of us is to uh, streamline project implementation unit and try to build the capacities of the uh, capacity of the government. Let's say procurement. Um, we need more on-job training on procurement in order for our procurement processes to be less lengthy and more robust. Uh, we need hand-holding in terms of financial management. We need hand-holding in, in project monitoring. Um, if you build capacities for each project separately, it means the government itself may not be able to um, do the right thing in the right time. But if you streamline these activities and build the capacity of the government on the job while, while the projects are ongoing, that might be more effective. Um, another thing is also proper uh, portfolio reviews that we have just started in Afghanistan, for example. Each quarter, um, quarter we do portfolio review of a Ministry of Finance as a governor and also um, ADB and other implementing institutions, and we see the bottlenecks and proper action plans are, um, are um, suggested so that um, the projects are, are monitored on time and then actions are taken. Um, there's also, um, uh, if you do not talk about the fund, uh, ADB only, but absorption capacity of the um, non-ADB, for example, projects that might impact um, the perspective of donors, um, that is again goes, uh, goes back to uh, project readiness and how um, we are really ready to um, uh, implement these projects in, um, 
um, in situations of turmoil or there, if there are crisis or, um, or we need to be a little bit flexible um, and give projects more time as we go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, just this was a good question to segue into the second part, which is more about, uh, you know, uh, fragility um, issues. If there's no further questions, I'll just uh, continue with the, um, um, with the panel. Um, so, uh, Minister Tuyoti, um, yeah, um, just talking in more in general about the SIDS, the Pacific, um, you know, what areas in your view need, um, uh, you know, special attention in the design and the implementation uh, of projects? Uh, can you enlighten us how you're dealing with, of course, the obvious um, well, absorptive capacity issues or the, the, the shortage of um, uh, staff in, in governments that are generally very small uh, in the Pacific? Well, I think uh, I mentioned earlier the importance of uh, investment in uh, uh, project preparation, uh, consultations with the key uh, sort of sectors that are involved and also uh, engaging with uh, our um, uh, with the ADB uh, sort of project staff, uh, because we, we always have to uh, uh, to think ahead, are we going to have the right uh, sort of personnel that with the right technical uh, expertise to be able to deliver that? Uh, and uh, if we don't, uh, if we're not able to uh, uh, source them from our own uh, sort of qualified people, then the opportunity, then we need to look at do we go out and sort of contract uh, people from outside? Uh, and, and I think there's been a lot of flexibility in terms of our the work that we do with the ADB in that uh, in some uh, cases where there's an agency to make sure that we address uh, any delays in, is to borrow uh, people, uh, experts from ADB itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have the office in, uh, in, in uh, uh, people from uh, seconded from from Manila, from uh, Sydney, uh, or, or from uh, Fiji. But there's also the opportunity. Then, uh, and, and one major benefit of that is that our our own people then sort of uh, their capacity built uh, in terms of being able to do that. But we're also currently now uh, recruiting some sort of people for uh, the central. Uh, coordination unit within the Ministry of Finance, and we are proactively uh, making sure that we bring into that unit so the skills sets that will be required that may not be available in, with the implementing agencies or that it will take so much time for us to bring people from outside to. to. So we're very much aware of the need to make sure that there are no delays uh, and uh, we our procurement uh, processes are sufficiently flexible to be able to deal with uh, those situations. I, yeah. I understand that the minister has been, has, uh, has intimate knowledge of ADB since the late 80s when he was a director's advisor um, in the other building uh, on Roxas um, um, uh, Boulevard. So he has a long experience with ADB. Do, do you see the improvements there? Because uh, we and IED also have the luxury of sometimes saying that we need more bodies on the ground in the Pacific because they are, uh, there are so many uh, special cases, fragile uh, situations, and uh, they just need more, um, more, more staff also from ADB. Do you, do you see over the years an improvement in this area? I, I'm, I'm very positive that uh, sort of going forward, uh, that uh, I think we're laying the groundwork for, um, for our own people to be capacity built but also in terms of uh, bringing in additional resources that will stay on long-term contracts with us to ensure that we sort of continue to do that. We are uh, sort of currently working on a 20-year sort of strategy, and obviously that we are excited about uh, receiving ADF resources mm -hmm. because it's going to help us in some of the key investment areas that we, we've uh, uh, put in place. And, and especially in investment in human capital, health and education, uh, there will continue to be a need for infrastructural uh, development, uh, climate resilience. It, it's, uh, uh, we've talked about uh, some transformational 
uh, investment like the submarine cable that's going to help us with the digital economy, the delivery of efficient services uh, to our communities and also to support uh, the development of the private uh, sector. And, and we've also been working very closely with our, our private sector. We have a sort of four more meetings every three months. It's really for, for us to understand the kind of enabling environment that they want because we really want the private sector to take on some of the responsibilities that the, the government is presently responsible for. And we think that now is the right time for us to work with them uh, to develop that uh, and for some of the government uh, services to be withdrawn. Um, maybe I see uh, John uh, raising his hand, so maybe, uh, John, would, would you like to react to this in particular? Thanks, uh, Walter. Uh, yeah, I, I, just like, I uh, can't resist the temptation to respond to uh, Marvin's very good question about um, absorbative capacity because I think it is the, probably the, one of the biggest uh, issues. Uh, I mean, from a donor perspective, um, we see financial assistance rising uh, increasing uh, significantly to uh, particularly to the Pacific, both from the World Bank and the ADB. Uh, so there's a tremendous opportunity. The banks are doing the right thing in terms of flow of finance. The real challenge is to convert, you know, that finance into bankable investment-ready projects, and then to carry out the implementation. Uh, and it is a big challenge in a in a um, in, uh, in many Pacific countries, which which are thinly staffed. Uh, uh, and um, uh, and I think you know very the very first uh, way to meet that challenge is, as uh, Minister uh, Chioti said earlier, government leadership. There has to be strong government leadership from the top, a real commitment and a de determination to grab this opportunity uh, and to to develop a pipeline of um, projects through good planning. Um, but then there's I think there's you know responsibilities uh, from both donors and the ADB to look at ways to address the capacity constraints. I mean, the procurement rules are complex. You know, the safeguard rules are complex. They're important, they're high standard, but, and they will deliver quality and sustainable infrastructure, but they're complex. Financial syst management systems are complex, um, you know, for, for any government official to get your head around that. Um, and so we all need to work in clever ways to, um, to, to address those uh, constraints. Uh, I think the IEG report had some really good directions there. I think most important is boosting staff presence on the ground when there's no substitute for people on the ground who can form relationships, really get an understanding of local context, local issues and you know can talk uh, to senior officials and, and get a, a sense of how to solve problems as they arise in, in the course of a project. Um, we need to be really clever about our technical assistance uh, you know, it, it, we need to tailor it to different situations. Sometimes it can be a quick fix, uh, you know, some expert advice brought in quickly to deal with some engineering design issue, but other times, uh, you know, it might require embedding uh, a person in a, in a ministry uh, for, a, for, for some period of time to, to help, uh, you know, work through contract milestones and, and deliver good contract management. Um, and I think thirdly, uh, there really needs to be good uh, coordination among donors, uh, and that's an ongoing effort. We need to, um, uh, and I know there's mechanisms, we, we, we do have a lot of dialogue with New Zealand on this, uh, with both banks, uh, but ways to avoid overwhelming um, ministries uh, with, with finance and to ensure that, it's, uh, that each project is given a proper and due attention. Maybe Emma can just follow on from that and, and tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what's going on in part in maybe decentralizing or building local capacity and, and also is, is part doing anything in this area of uh, M&E and, and donor coordination to support uh, the many countries that you're, you're dealing with, uh, many of which very small. Yeah. No, I think um, John segued really well into to what we think is quite critical in the, the Pacific and um, has come out of our thinking about FCAS in the Pacific context. Um, you know, we've had a specialised FCAS position within the Pacific Department for over 10 years now, um, and that position has really changed in role and function over time. And in the last couple of years, we've seen a real pivot from knowledge and talking with others, etc., about FCAS into a um, application as to what does this mean day-to-day -day in our operations in the Pacific. So 
things like looking at procurement processes and how they can be better tailored to fit, fit countries, how packages can be better designed, um, efforts to put um, project offices on the ground with our Pacific country offices, which are rolled out across all of our Pacific developing member countries, um, bar Nui. Um, but that has made a big difference, having people on the ground. So it's really concerted strategic thinking about what is fragility in the Pacific, what does it mean, how can we start to work on some of those root causes through just-in-time technical assistance in the right area, structuring our business practices to really fit small island um, context as opposed to large, large Asian country context and trying to then formalise that um, within our own policies and practices. So they're not just one-off workarounds, but it's the way we do things regularly. And I think that's, that's quite critical. And, and really, it's also the message coming out of Strategy 2030 with the focus on a differentiated approach in, in, um, to, to different income sets of countries. Uh, I understand ADB has recently appointed a focal point again for the for the FCAS. I think he's uh, uh, present here. Sam, you're you're here. So, <laughs> um, Emma, Emma, maybe you can, uh, or maybe maybe Sam can say something about his role going forward. Because there was between the the two positions, the, the previous position and yours, there was some some gap. Is there any change in your your role? Thank you uh, for this opportunity. I think um, I think. I think ADB has actually done quite a bit with FCAS. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the Pacific, of course, this is an existential issue for the, for the region. So they have had the Pacific approach and a lot has been done. Um, I think a lot more can be done for ADB to improve our work in, in the FCAS countries and we plan to do that uh, going forward. Um, I think in, in Afghanistan, we've improved our portfolio there significantly. In, uh, in Myanmar, the conflict sensitivity of our approaches there uh, has deepened significantly. So I think going forward, we're going to try to work and continue to improve on this to improve the effectiveness of our operations in these countries. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe this is a moment to ask uh, if there's any further questions on this particular topic of um, uh, fragility issues before we move on. My question is to John Larkin, actually. You mentioned earlier, I mean, being uh, one of the largest donors, actually, also you have a quite strong interest, not just in the Pacific, also in the other part of the um, Asia regions. So how do you see this concept of fragility, as mentioned by Sam, also Emma, actually, that applies across different regions in, in Asia, actually? I mean, uh, and particularly, I mean, in the longer uh, term, actually, that, because ADB somehow now working on to, uh, to improve or even uh, change some of the policies that they, the, the institution has done uh, for some time, actually, in the area of, of conflict affected and, and also fragility, I think, uh, from, from the perspective of, of, of ADF donor countries. Thank you. No, thank you, um, Edie Kassam. Uh, it, that's a, a very good point. Um, you know, there are a range of concessional assistance countries that are uh, classified as fragile and conflict affected and, and some of them are in the Pacific broadly defined, East Timor for example, Papua New Guinea uh, which has its own uh, fragilities um, and uh, you know we really welcome the uh, stepping up of, of the FCAS, uh, ADB's efforts on, on FCAS and I was I participated in the seminar yesterday where Sam um, and others presented on, on the, the steps that ADB are taking. Um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, just it's it's uh, just really important um, for those uh, uh, for for operations ADB to be to, to be uh, conflict sensitive to to have done the thorough political economy and context uh, analysis. Um, you know, for there to be a you know a steady uh, uh, and strong supply of concessional assistance for those countries, um, uh, and and to really help them uh, yeah, develop. Um, the, the economic infrastructure and develop their assets uh, in, in ways. So there's got to be under, underpinned by very sound um, uh, analysis uh, and uh, uh, economic, uh, you know, identification of the, of the key economic opportunities as well. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I could, while I have the floor too, Walter, just one further point on the absorptive capacity. I, I think, um, uh, and, and I think um, part of the capacity development is also using ADB operations to build up uh, local business capacity 
and local skills uh, to um, uh, and to really look look for opportunities to engage with local contractors. Uh, you know, whether it's a roads project uh, or uh, you know construction of a bridge. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a big effort underway uh, to to build up. You know, th through particularly through Australian aid and uh, probably other donors as well to b build up the um, skills and technical capacities of, of tradesmen uh, across the Pacific. There is some high quality firms out there, and it's a way of uh, you know looking to to, to tap into their skills and, and, and ensuring that they can participate effectively in in ADB operations. You don't think that would dilute the, uh, the focus of ADB, which is also um, has been doing a lot of infrastructure, but are you implying that ADB should move in that direction? Then? All right, maybe, uh, yes, yeah, uh, Karen, if maybe. I could add on, on that as well, because I think that's one area where some um, fresh thinking would be, would be good as we look at the new Pacific approaches. How do we make sure that the infrastructure that's being built is sustainable? Um, we talk a lot about implementation capacity and making sure that you know, we deliver uh, a new piece of, of infrastructure, but there's some real issues there about ongoing uh, operations and maintenance, and I think that's where uh, building up the local contractor market can help ensure that it is sustainable. Um, but we also need to look at new financing models uh, for that uh, O&M as well and make sure that the business case is sort of pitched to governments to uh, make sure that's built in up front because mm -hmm. over, you know, it, it's about moving beyond cost of building something to the, the total life cycle cost. Mm -hmm. And I think local contractors have a big role to play there. Yeah, Minister, uh, yes, um, I, I saw you nodding also heavily on, on this uh, suggestion. Is there anything you want to, to add on this? No, I think we, uh, we, we need to uh, sort of work together to ensure that if we don't have the capacity, if we don't have the resources, and obviously we have sort of multi-partners uh, working, and surely some of us will be able to sort of come together and uh, think of an innovative uh, way to make sure that we have access to those capacity that is going to help us uh, in terms of uh, in. Uh, investing better, sort of building back better, and uh, just uh, uh, providing for a resilient economy, resilient budget, and, and, and communities. And, and I think that uh, we, we should all be open to opportunities like that to bring those resources together. Thank you. Emma, you were also wanting to say something? Yeah, I think we've, we've got a few um, interesting practical examples of where this is happening in the Pacific. Um, we've um, built a desalination plant in um, the Marshall Islands, which involved having a, a medium-term sort of contract to manage the operation and maintenance of that facility for many, many years after it was first implemented. Um, we'll be doing the same in Kiribati as well. Um, at the end of those um, typically five or seven years management contracts, there. Um, is opportunity for government to take on that, that operational role themselves, or they may well choose to roll over and, and tender again for someone to maintain those facilities. I think something we're also doing, um, and I'm probably more aware of on the health and education side, but when we're building facilities, and I'm thinking of our health centres across PNG, we're designing them in a way to minimise the cost to government of ongoing maintenance to them. Um, so these are fairly indestructible buildings. Um, there's consideration given to the impact of earthquakes and cyclones, um, fireproofing the buildings, um, very tough cladding that is difficult to pull off, is difficult to damage by running into it and other sorts of things. And I think it's investing a bit more money up front um, it, to save money over the whole life cycle of the, the building. And so life cycle costing of projects is, is also something at the forefront of our minds. Uh, thanks, uh, Emma. I think uh, that, that sort of um, brings us to the, the third part also on the future of ADF. And uh, so far, uh, you know, we've seen uh, positive examples of what's changing and uh, how um, the program is also adjusting. Of course, uh, yeah, we could take also a little bit more um, um, pessimistic view and uh, talk about the heavy clouds on the horizon of the Pacific, the, the dark clouds, the climate change and the need, well, as was one of the uh, recommendations, the need for uh, central attention for climate change adaptation. 
uh, not only, I think, in the Pacific, but also in um, uh, a very dry and, 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 and vulnerable country in that respect in, uh, in, in Afghanistan. So with uh, all these uh, likely very major changes, I mean, how do you see the role of the ADF there? And, Shouldn't it grow a lot more than it does uh, in terms of the grants? We're, we're all talking, uh, you know, maybe less, but um, concessional finance should, of course, um, uh, is growing, but the grant uh, financing is um, at a, a certain still maybe limited level. How, how do you see this um, going forward, the, the role of the ADF in the Pacific, also in, in the area of climate change? Uh, Minister, to your... Well, obviously, uh, in terms of the uh, contribution of ADF uh, resources, uh, we, it enabled us to graduate from the LDC uh, in the year 2000 and uh, sort of 14. I think that uh, before that we were, so our per capita income was about $2,000. It's, uh, uh, it's 4,500 US dollars now in 2019, and I think it's, it's really because of the catalyst uh, role of ADF in terms of improving uh, so the uh, so the economic uh, well-being of our people, the creating jobs, uh, the uh, private sector, uh, its uh, engagement in uh, the investment in uh, uh, health and education. There's a long way for us to go, especially. Uh, we're, we're quite keen to invest more resources in early childhood uh, sort of development. Uh, obviously, for the 2040 strategy going forward, we need to have educated and and, uh, and healthy people. Uh, and some of the key challenges that we're trying to deal with, and we that's why we need to continue to have access to uh, ADF, is sort of uh, climate change impacts, uh, the NCDs, and also this early childhood uh, development, this sort of stunting um, um, thing that, that's uh, impacting us at a very high rate in the Pacific Island regions. And I think as uh, leaders, we have a, a moral responsibility to make sure that we try and reverse those, those trends. And, uh, of, but in terms of the infrastructure, we need to make them resilient. We're encouraging our people to move inland. We're, uh, it, it's uh, the, the potential uh, benefit of the investment in the submarine cable is going to help us to be more efficient in the way we sort of do business uh, in terms of engaging uh, with, with the community. Uh, so we, for us, we're quite uh, sort of positive in, in terms of going forward. Uh, and uh, we um, obviously sort of continue to expect that we will have access to... Uh, to ADF resources, but who knows by 2040 where we are one of the sort of high growth path uh, economy and, and we may be saying to you, look, we don't need your money, but we'll give you, uh, we'll be part of the donors uh, to, to help other countries uh, to develop models that we're doing now. So I'm optimistic, uh, and uh, but it, it's really important that we uh, continue to engage uh, with our development partners to get us to that point and then we will say well we're one one less um, seat that's going to forever depend on um, ADF yes well that's a great message a uh, message of hope and I'm sure you're moving uh, towards that that goal um, maybe yeah with Afghanistan the situation is very fluid and and perhaps you're at a very different in a very diff different situation. I mean, what is the outlook that you see uh, for Afghanistan and uh, the need for um, support, uh, you know, from funds like the, the, the ADF in the future? How do you like to see um, also the interaction with, with ADB? Um, let me a little bit um, sh shed light on, on, on the donor portfolio and the needs of Afghanistan um, and going forward in, in general. Um, as I mentioned before, we have 54 percentage of poverty rate and with 3 percent growth, we are not going to elevate um, the situation um, unless we have higher growth rates. Um, and more revenue. In terms of the total aid that is uh, being contributed to Afghanistan from 2010 to 2018, we have 46% reduction in, in aid. We are still, as I, 49% uh, um, of our budget is only domestic revenue and the rest we are still dependent on aid. 
from $8 billion that is being um, annually allocated or uh, committed to Afghanistan, which is both security and development, um, um, the, the forecast is that in the coming years, by 2020 or 21, that will reach to $5 billion, uh, which is a major reduction. So we really need $2 billion each year in terms of raising revenues to go ahead. Um, our plan for Afghanistan, of course, the vision is to be self-reliant or at least enter the list of countries who are normal aid-dependent countries and not um, treated as exception cases. But for that, we need a good basis to start with. Um, we need revenue generation schemes, and um, for that, the government has a plan to invest on projects that raise um, revenues and um, create employment. Um, one. Um, one option as we go ahead because um, aid is not a sustainable source of financing for Afghanistan and a certain analysis has shown and proven that. But um, what is the way ahead? Would be a blended financing system. Um, are we really ready um, to go into concessional borrowing? Um, we need to raise the capacity in the government um, to do better debt management. Um, or um, raise the capacity of, uh, or do better grant management as well. Um, there are certain areas, if you see the infrastructure needs in the next 10 years even, to, um, to complete basic infrastructure in Afghanistan, we need more than like um, $4 billion in the, 10, uh, the next 10 years. Um, now those are the um, points where you see the need for further investment in that we are we would need support for the next at least um, five, four to five years old, four to five years, but um, the plan is that we graduate from um, um, wanting more aid to a more sustainable um, um, modality of financing. One of the areas that ADB could um, um, provide further assistance would to partner with other banks, for example, AIIB or other international forums uh, to support Afghanistan to access blended financing system. Um, the other thing that I would um, that would take me back to the earlier question was the um, uh, role of the private sector. How would the procurement packages or the contract award packages could be made in a way to um, um, promote uh, local contractors so that they can um, better um, um, function in, in fragile state contexts. Um, role of the private sector is, uh, would be very immense and um, our vision is that as we go for forward and see into concessional borrowing, we'll also um, promote the role of um, 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 PPPs, public private financing, and private companies to come and invest in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John, um, just to just a brief answer, I mean, maybe to a big question, I mean, uh, ADF is, has become a grant uh, um, facility for uh, just a small um, range of um, uh, Afghans and SIDS countries. I mean, how does uh, Australia see that and how does ADF, how do you see I mean, from the Australian side, uh, the role of ADF, it, can it also have some thematic focus that goes beyond maybe those countries, maybe to other countries in Group A or maybe even Group B, uh, depending on the, the particular theme? Let, let John think about that. Sorry, well, that's I a was tough, just going to um, make a, a couple of comments, um, picking up on uh, your question around the, the use of other climate funds and, and also the replenishment discussions this week. Um, I, you know, I think uh, my take from the replenishment this week is that there was a really um, strong acceptance of the challenges and the needs for uh, ADF eligible countries. Um, but you know, putting it in the context of uh, a, a number of replenishments um, that ha that are going on sort of globally, uh, pretty much at the same time as ADF, I think that was on the mind of a, a number of partners around the table. Um, it, we've got the IDA replenishment, the Global Fund replenishment, and, and the GCF replenishment, all of which are, are sort of happening at the same time. Um, and you know, it's clear that there's issues outside our region that are um, focusing the minds of, of non-regional partners as well. And I think you know, everyone understands uh, the need to consider uh, those issues, particularly in, in the African context. Um, but one, one thing that came up sort of time and again was around the GCF. And fortunately, the GCF has had a, a really strong replenishment um, this time. And 
you know, a number of uh, ADB members have contributed, really stepped up contributions and, and contributed very generously to that. But I, I think what's um, missing in the discussion is, is that the GCF won't spend itself. And I see a really important role for uh, ADB in being able to partner with the GCF um, and co-finance with the GCF. Um, you know, the ADB, I think, has been probably the most successful implementer of GCF uh, projects in the Pacific and has built up that expertise and it knows how to work um, with the GCF, uh, which is not an easy, uh, easy beast to do that with. Um, and if we don't have uh, climate funds through the ADF replenishment, then I don't see there being um, a really strong ability for ADB to be able to work alongside the GCF. So I don't think it's really an, an either or in terms of, you know, do you put climate funds into ADF or GCF? I think it, it needs to work together. John, would you like to just add to that or agree yeah. with that? Uh, thanks, uh, Walter. Um, no, it's quite a profound question you've asked. Uh, the, um, I mean, there's it, it no doubt uh, in Strategy 2030 provides a very clear mandate that the ADF should be a grant-based fund targeted at the poorest and most vulnerable countries. And, and so I think it's quite appropriate that we, uh, we prioritise the FCAS and the SIDS that are in uh, high or, or moderate debt distress uh, for grants. And, um, and uh, you know, we, 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 uh, we, Australia thinks that, uh, you know, the country allocations are very important there. And in fact, the IEG report was quite prescient in, uh, uh, you know, foreshadowing uh, the limitations of the PBA formula and the need for special allocations for, for both SIDS and, and Afghanistan in di different ways. Um, and we think country allocations are important because they're responsive to country partnership strategies and are, cons and are prepared priorities identified in consultation with partner governments. I mean, there are some very good innovations uh, under discussion in the ADF um, uh, 13 negotiations, partly inspired, I think, by the IEG report, uh, which expand um, the scope of grants. Uh, for example, the pilot private sector window would provide grants for all Group A countries uh, to promote private sector growth. Uh, the disaster response facility is looking at uh, being expanded uh, and uh, to provide an ex exceptional support to Group B countries in circumstances of forced displacement like Bangladesh experienced last year. So I think um, that th those uh, are, are very worthwhile uh, um, proposals worthy of discussion. I um, mean, Austra Australia is um, uh, a little bit cautious about um, uh, an, an oversized thematic pool and uh, an approach that is too permissive in um, spreading grants, uh, you know, widely among uh, Group B countries. Um, you know, we think we have to be disciplined uh, in, in, in the, the use of scarce grant resources. We have to think about how they're financed, uh, you know, where they're going to come from uh, in respect of donors, uh, in respect of the contribution from internal revenue. Uh, and, um, and we think that, uh, you know, more credit worthy uh, Group B countries do have other uh, sources of, of finance and uh, access uh, through other ADB channels. But uh, of course these are all issues for negotiation and, uh, and highly contested views I might add, so I'm sure people have right. uh, many views. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, just a last word to, to Emma to, to close it off and we... Uh, I think we have coffee and, um, uh, well, uh, maybe a brief wrap-up. Uh, Emma, how do, you, how do you respond? This is a very, you're dealing with a very, very wide range of country programs, some of which more and some of which less uh, ADF, and how do you deal with, with this in the, in the future? Yeah, um, I was really welcome the, the positive outlook from Samoa of, of eventually graduating to be a donor. But um, certainly in the, the medium to longer term, there's still going to be a set of small island developing states who are fragile and will need continued grant assistance. I think this week with the ADF replenishment has provided us with a good opportunity to look back and see how far the countries have come in terms of transport connectivity, digital connectivity, um, improvements in health and education performance but it's also made us sit down and think, where are we really going over the next, certainly over the next four years, but, but certainly longer over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, that's why issues that are picked up in the, the, in the thematic fund 
climate change and, and how to get money spent on adaptation. I think we've done really well on mitigation and renewable energy, but climate adaptation is, is absolutely central to the Pacific survival and, and needs more attention than it's getting currently. Um, we've talked about the capacity constraints in these countries, but it's how do we use the capacity that is there better? How do we bring the private sector in? Things like the private sector window, but also creating the right environment, policy environment for the private sector to thrive. How do we ensure that women are contributing fully into these economies, dealing with issues of gender-based violence and um, social inclusion, etc.? Um, areas that we didn't talk about in the Pacific before, social protection are coming to a fore. Um, demand for health and education support is growing. So it's a, it's a really increasing list. Um, and I might end off with mentioning ocean health. I think that was one really exciting thing to come out of ADB's annual meeting in Fiji. Um, the small island states are really big ocean states, as they often describe themselves. And as custodians and guardians of one of the, the great last sort of wild tuna sources and many other scientific resources in the Pacific. Um, we're going to have to be continuing to work with Pacific nations to ensure the protection of that and the, the revenue from that for the future of these countries. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, that was actually part of my wrap up, but um, <laughs> we're almost there. Um, no, I, we've touched on um, a range of issues and we've just started discussion, I'm sure, and, and, and there are so many issues that we didn't even uh, touch uh, broadly upon. There are, there are so many aspects of these, uh, of these problems in uh, fragile countries, in, in, in SITS, um, ADB's role, ADF's role, uh, ADF's future. As you know, the, the ADF replenishment, this was just the first uh, round. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot more discussion coming up. Um, but um, anyway, I think it was an, a very interesting uh, discussion and um, I would like to get a good round of applause for our uh, excellent panelists. Thank you.